Morning. Morning. How are we? That's all right. That's all right. Oh, man, I'm super excited with fear and trepidation to share this chapter of Scripture with you because I reckon, I reckon Revelation chapter 6 is the most complex chapter of the Bible I've ever had to preach in my life. So God has heard Tony's prayers, but I'm going to pray just one more time because I think I need just an extra dose of the Spirit today. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that you have heard our prayers, that you have seen our worship, and we just want to offer ourselves to you now, and we pray that your Holy Spirit, who inspired the word, would teach us what it means today. Give us clarity, and I pray that you would use me today and help us to be concise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're in Revelation chapter 6. We are continuing our journey through Revelation as a church, and today we're continuing our series with the end in mind, redemption, restoration, and the remnant in the book of Revelation. By the way, Chris, that timer hasn't started, so you got to, or oh, it starts when I tick this thing. Chris is helping me out with a giant clock at the back to help me keep on time here. It's good. Redemption, restoration, and the remnant in the book of Revelation. So... Today we're going to be talking about the seven seals, the seven seals of Scripture that we had in, introduced in Revelation chapter 5, and we're going to follow through all seven of these seals, so you're going to have to buckle up. It's going to be a bit of a wild ride, but what I've done is I've, I've put a number of texts, because we don't have the time to necessarily turn to every passage in Scripture to define all of these symbols that are used, but we're going to talk about many of them. And so there will be extra passages that we'll make reference to that we may not have time to look up today. So I encourage you, it's the only time in my whole life of teaching and whatever else I do that I would encourage someone to have a phone. But feel free to take a photo of the slides, or if you like the slides, you can have them all at the end. Just come give me a flash drive. Starting off, we have to jump into the seven seals from the context of the chapters we've just been reading before. So let's do a quick recap of what Quentin covered last week in Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5. So in Revelation chapter 4, we had a picture of the throne room of heaven, and there was a throne, and on that throne was God the Father, and before that throne was what's described as the seven spirits of God, which is a name for the Holy Spirit. You can see that in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, where it describes the Holy Spirit with these seven attributes. So in that throne room scene, it starts with a picture, a vision of God, and then it starts to build these concentric circles around God. Notice, it's the Father, it's the Holy Spirit. Where is Jesus? He's not present in the vision so far. Around the throne you have the four living creatures, one with the face like a lion, one with the face like an ox, one with the face of a man, one with the face of an eagle. And it's said that they, day and night, continually worship God as the self-existent one, as the creator. And then it described that there were 24 thrones around them, another concentric circle. And those 24 elders we discovered were almost certainly resurrected people who are followers of Jesus because they say we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and you have redeemed us. And so they throw their crowns on the ground and they worship Jesus as their Redeemer. You can read in Matthew chapter 27, 51 to 53 if you want an inkling of who those people were but there was a description of a resurrection at Jesus' death that seems to be these individuals. We following so far? Okay. They worship God as the Redeemer. And then in the vision, it says that there appeared in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the four living creatures, in the midst of the 24 elders, a lamb as though it had been slain. And they worship the lamb as the Redeemer. So are we seeing this picture? Now, it's said that the four living creatures worshipped all day and night, and every time that they worshipped, the 24 elders got off of their thrones, threw their crowns on the ground, and worshipped God. So this picture continues to describe this idea of concentric circles of continual worship. It then describes a multitude of angels outside that circle also doing the same thing. And here's our summary of the key points that, that I took from Quentin's sermon last week from those chapters. Point number one, when we enter the throne room scene of heaven, we are seeing a picture of what heaven is like. It is continual worship of God as the self-existent one, as the creator, and as the redeemer. And this is 
insightful for us about how we are to live on earth. Our lives are to be offerings of continual worship, day and night, sleeping and waking, and everything that we do, think and say, we are to look to God as our creator and as our redeemer and honor him in all things. Amen? Now, the second thing that this tells us is that tells us the starting point of the next chapter. Because when we looked at that scene, there was a, a part of that chapter where Jesus was not present. The Father was there, the Holy Spirit was there, the elders were there, the 24 elders, the, the four living creatures, all of these things are there, but who was missing? Jesus had not yet appeared. And this tells us an important detail for the starting point of Revelation chapter 6. This tells us that when Jesus appeared in heaven to receive his crown, his enthronement, is when the seven seals will start. And when did that take place? Well, according to Revelation 5, 6, and 9, it says that they described him as the lamb, as though he had been slain. And he had seven eyes that were the seven spirits of God that were sent into all the earth. When was the Holy Spirit sent to all the earth? At Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover. Are we tracking so far? So this tells us two things. Number one, the point of all of Revelation 4 and 5 is continual worship of God as creator and redeemer. That's why he's worthy of our worship. Point number two, it says that the seven seals starts in AD 31 at the day of Pentecost. We tracking so far? I hope I haven't lost you yet. I've got lots of pictures and hopefully those pictures will help. Okay, before we dive into the seven seals, we have our starting point. The day of Pentecost in AD 31, after the resurrection of Jesus. Before we get into this sequence of prophecy, it's important for us to highlight a principle that we have seen through our study of the book of Daniel and that we will continue to see in our study of the book of Revelation. And that idea is repeat and enlarge. So don't get too bogged down by this graph. I thought this might help simplify if you want to understand the pattern of the apocalyptic prophecies or the end time prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, it follows this sequence. If you understand the sequence that we started off last year in Daniel chapter 2, if you know that sequence, you understand Revelation's prophecies. If you don't get Daniel 2, you need to go back and start there. But if you get Daniel 2, you get Daniel 7. And if you get Daniel 7, you get Daniel 8 and 9. And if you get that, you understand Daniel 11 and 12. And if you understand that, you understand all of the prophecies of Revelation in terms of their broad scope. In Daniel chapter 2, we had a description of the empires that would travel from the time of Daniel, the prophet, until the end of the world and the establishment of God's kingdom. And it looked like this. The Babylonian, the Babylonian empire would come, and that was the day of Daniel. That would be followed by the Persian Empire, followed by the Greek Empire, followed by the Roman Empire. Then Rome would be divided into split nations. And during that time, God would establish his kingdom. That's the pattern. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, God's kingdom. When you come to Daniel 7, it tells us the same story. It tells us that Babylon will continue and Medo-Persia will follow it. Then the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, and then Rome will be divided and we found out as we studied in Daniel chapter 7 earlier this year that we learned more information, didn't we, about the divided Rome period. We learned there would be a heavenly judgment. We learned that there would be a number of things taking place. And then at the end of all of that, God's kingdom is established. Are we following the pattern? I heard total silence. Is it making sense? Okay. Daniel 8 and 9. Babylon is gone. Follows the pattern. Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, God's kingdom. You get to Daniel 11 and 12, continues on. Babylon's already gone. Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, divided Rome, God's kingdom. When we get to Revelation, Babylon has been destroyed. Medo Persia has been destroyed. The Greek Empire has been destroyed. And we come to the first century in John's day, and what is the empire that rules the world? Rome is the empire. So as we look at the rest of the prophecies of the book of Revelation, where do they start? They start in the first century with the Roman Empire in John's day. And so as we dive into the seven seals today, we know that when we start with the first seal, and those are my beautiful little uh, Picasso drawings for you, thanks to uh, some beautiful Canva art. <laughs> 
It starts with the first century, and as we work through the seven seals, we're working all the way down to the establishment of God's kingdom because we're joining into the same pattern from prophet to the end of time. Just say amen if that made sense. All right, cool. Are we good to dive into the seven seals now? All right, nine minutes of, uh, of preparation. Now it's time to get into the nitty-gritty. All right. So there are two things we're going to talk about today. Number one is the historical application. How does this prophecy relate to the grand picture of the historical narrative of God's people from John's day until Jesus returns? The second thing we're going to look at is what spiritual application does that have for me today? Because let's let's face it, prophecy is like cool for people who like prophecy, but for people like me, all us plebs who... This doesn't make a lot of sense to unless we dig real, real, real deep and pray really hard. How does that make sense and relevance to my life today? Fair question? So those are the two things we're going to talk about today. We'll start with the historical application. Revelation chapter 6, turn with me in your Bible if you'd like to, and it'll be on the screen as well. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Who opens the seals? The Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ. Now when I saw... The lamb, he opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. So I'm not into like the real fancy drawings with crazy beasts. They scare me. So these are my my friendly kid version. Hopefully that's helpful to you as well as to me. So we have this picture. The four living creatures are there. One of them speaks and says, come and see. Here comes this horse. But we have to determine what do these symbols mean. In Scripture, we see a white horse at another place in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 19, there is a description of Jesus riding on a white horse into battle at the day of judgment. This rider of this horse in this picture that John saw was wearing a crown. Now, if you remember back, if you were with us when we did our, our study of the, 12, the seven churches of Revelation, we talked about a Greek word called Stephanos, and it was a type of crown. And that crown is not the crown of royalty, it's the crown of victory. The crown that was given when you won the Olympic Games. And so this rider is wearing a crown of victory. And the crown of victory we see in Scripture is over and over again in the book of Revelation something that those who are faithful to Jesus are wearing, and something that Jesus himself wears because he is the one who has conquered, who has overcome sin and death and reigns and gives you the crown of life as you trust in him for victory. The third thing that we have in this symbol is the bow. The rider is carrying a bow. And in Habakkuk 3, verse 8 and verse 13 and a number of other places, we have a description that says that God's judgment comes as a bow, as arrows, in judgment against those who have rejected his salvation, yeah? To bring justice and retribution upon the wicked. The last thing that we have in this symbol is conquering, overcoming power of the gospel, that where the gospel goes, there is victory. So let's put all these symbols together and let's see if we can make sense of this. In this vision, he has a picture of this white horse with a rider on it, and this description aptly matches Jesus riding victoriously, coming with the good news to overcome sin in our lives and to give us victory. Is that making sense? Now, this is interesting because when we look at the historical data and we look at the time period from John's day down to the end of time, this matches very well with a period of church history that we've already spoken about in our Seven Churches series. This matches very clearly the period of the apostolic church from AD 31 when Jesus was crucified and resurrected until about the end of the first century when the early church was faithful. You remember the message to Ephesus, the church that was the first church and then towards the end started to lose its first love but had been faithful. And this matches that timeline very aptly that the early church was led by the power of the gospel and was carrying on in this way and the gospel was spreading like wildfire around the world. Following this, he sees a second image. And it says this, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. 
And he saw another horse, this time it was fiery red, and it went out. It was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So in the vision, he sees a second horse come out. It's fiery red. The rider's got a sword in his hand. But what do these symbols mean? Well, following on the heels of the apostolic period of the church, we come to about A.D. 100 to approximately 320 A.D., and there's a number of things that connect with the symbols of this picture. Number one, it says that the rider on this horse was given authority to take peace from the earth. Now, Jesus described his own proclamation of the gospel being something that would bring freedom and liberty to those who received it. But in Matthew chapter 10, he says that, did you think that I came to bring peace? He says, no, I came to bring a sword. Well, what does that mean, right? What is Jesus saying when he says, I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword? He says, I came to turn father against child, right? Sister against brother, The enemies of your household will be your enemies. And what was he saying? Everywhere that the gospel comes into someone's life, it tends to be followed by persecution from those who do not choose to receive it. Have you ever experienced persecution? I remember when I first became a follower of Jesus, I was 17, and I remember going back to visit my friends that I grew up with in Southern California, and they they said things to me like, bro, you're different, man. You're weird. You used to be cool, Robbie, but uh, now you just talk about all this Jesus stuff all the time. And that was legit. Some of these kids I grew up with, I went back and saw them, and I remember them just telling me, you're a, you're a freak, bro. You're one of those Jesus people now. Leave me alone. And that's just a small, tiny, itty-bitty kind of persecution. But everywhere where the gospel goes, it divides. It changes lives, the lives of those who receive it, but it's also often rejected by others. And when people reject the gospel, they tend to reject those who have received the gospel. The word that was used there where it said that this rider would take peace from the earth and there would be killing of one another. The word there in the Greek is sphazo. Can you say that with me? That's a nice Greek word. Sphazo. (laughs) It's good. It's fun to hear you guys say these things. It does sound like spazo, doesn't it? Um, Slain is the word that this is translated as. What's really fascinating about this word is that every single instance of this in the New Testament, I looked them all up in Greek, every single instance of of this word in the New Testament relates to Jesus being slain or his followers being slain for their witness. This word specifically means persecution, martyrdom. And so what we see here is that following the reception of the gospel, there always follows a period of persecution, doesn't there? And that's what we see in the church history. We see from about A.D. 100, the end of the first century, until about the middle of the fourth century A.D., we see a period of persecution happening in the Christian era. What about the third seal? In the third seal, it says this, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales to measure things with. In his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Can you see why this is a complex chapter? Anybody feeling a little confused about any of these symbols? What does this stuff mean? So on the heels of persecution comes this third horse, and this third horse and rider has a set of scales in his hands. Now, why does he have a set of scales? What's the deal with the denarius? And why is he talking about how much food costs? Sounds like he was living in present-day Australia in 2023. (laughs) In this picture, we have a picture of famine. We have a picture of scarcity. A quart of wheat in this time period in Palestine was a one man's daily ration of bread. A quart of wheat is basically what you would need to feed a man enough bread for a day. And he's saying that a quart of wheat is going to cost you a denarius. Well, the denarius is one day's wage, so let's do some math. You go out to work, and you work all day, sweating everything up, and all of the money that you have acquired in one day is just enough for your bread for today. What about your family? Are they going to get to eat any bread that day? 
This is a serious situation of scarcity. Wheat was the standard. Now, if you were really poor, you would eat barley because it was cheaper and of lower quality. So you could buy three quarts of barley according to this vision. Now, that's enough for maybe a small family, maybe three, four people, to get a meager amount of food for one day, and that's going to cost you every cent you earned today. This is a picture of famine, isn't it? It's a picture of scarcity. It's a picture of hunger. But what's really fascinating is that when we're looking at these symbols, we're not just talking about physical things, are we? We're also talking about spiritual realities. Amos chapter 8, verse 11 says this. Oh, I put the wrong one in there. Oops. Well, while we're turning there, Amos chapter 11 talks about there being a serious type of famine. But that type of famine was not just a physical famine, it was a spiritual famine. And in Amos chapter 8, verse 11, it says this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So often in Scripture, bread is used as a description of God's word, something that is given to provide a spiritual sustenance. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. God's word is powerful. God's word is sustenance to your spiritual life. Without God's word, people will perish. And the description that we have here is a description that matches the period of earth's history, the period of church history, if you will, from about 320 to 538 AD, where there was compromise that was creeping into the church. And the word of God was kept in the religious words of Latin, not the common language of the people. And during this time period, less and less people had access to the word of God. And instead of accessing God's word and learning for yourself, you must believe what the pastor says, what the priest says. You must accept what they say to you because you don't have any way to check or validate whether or not they're telling you the truth. This was a period of untold compromise where all sorts of pagan philosophies were brought into Christianity, into the institutionalized church, and people were led astray and were starting to be taken advantage of. That's a pretty destitute kind of picture, isn't it? Because what do you do when you don't have access to God's word for yourself? But notice that it said something else. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Now, we don't have time, again, to get into all this. If you'd like to talk more about it, let me know. Or take a picture of these and look these texts up later. Oil is commonly used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And the wine, according to Jesus, when he's in the, having the Last Supper, he says this Wine that you're about to drink, this grape juice, is the blood, my blood, of the covenant. And so even though during this time period there was a scarcity of God's word, as well as physical scarcity, people still had just as much access to the Holy Spirit and to the covenantal blood of Jesus to cover you and to be saved, because God is in the business of saving people based on whatever means he can use to get you what you need to be saved. Does that make sense? So even in times of spiritual scarcity, God is at work. And that's what we see exhibited here in the historical application of this prophecy. Oh, it was the right verse. I just had the wrong text there. Amos 8, 11. Revelation chapter 6, verse 7, the fourth seal. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on that horse was Death. And Hades, or the grave, followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. And I want you to remember that phrase. Hold on to that phrase. Sword, hunger, death, and beasts of the earth. Because that's going to come back around full circle in this message. The fourth horse comes and it's described as pale. Sometimes it describes it as green. And it's followed by death and Hades, right? Or the writer's name is death. It's followed by Hades, which means the grave. Sheol, the abode of the dead. Um, Yeah, I'm really enjoying my pictures. (laughs) What's fascinating about this is this picture is a picture of pestilence. It's a picture of disease, and it's a picture of death. The word that's used for pale in the Greek is the same use that's word, word that's used to describe someone when they are very sickly or even can be applied to the color of a corpse. When life has gone out of the flesh, 
This is the description of the color of the horse. This is implying that there is sickness, that there is death. And the writer's name was? Death. And it was followed by the grave. When it says a quarter of the earth, some scholars suggest that this relates to God's dominion. In other words, relates to God's people. We don't have time to delve too far into that. But if you'd like to know more about that, hit me up after. But this is a really apt description of the spiritual condition of the broader Christian church during the medieval period, isn't it? A time of spiritual death. A time where the truth was locked up into monasteries and not shared with the people. This is a time where people were not only having a scarcity of God's word, there was all sorts of corruption taking place. The church of God had become the institution that was murdering millions of people. This is not the picture that God had in mind when he said to start a church. But this, unfortunately, is what happens when, when we, as Christians, lose our way. We avoid the word of God. We turn our back on the gospel, and we start to make ourselves and our traditions the highest thing. But the truth is, all of our traditions, all of our ideas, all of our, our functions and institutions need to be prostrated before Jesus. We need to humble ourselves and let Jesus be Jesus. Let him be the leader, the Lord, as it's described in Scripture, the Savior. And whenever we take anything else and put it in the place of God, this is ultimately what happens. And this is what happened historically during this time period. The sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. We'll jump into in a bit more detail a bit later. But this is the covenant curses. This is where this comes from. And notice, there was persecution already mentioned. That's the sword. There was already famine mentioned. That's famine. <laughs> there was pestilence and death mentioned in this one. And what follows when you have famine, sword, pestilence? Well, you have a depopulation of the people and the wild beasts come in and take their place. I just finished reading a fascinating book, a heartbreaking book called The Chernobyl Prayer. And it was a book that talked about the description of the, the people and the anecdotes of the people who experienced the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in the 80s. And what was fascinating in that book is that as they talked about their description of their town, of Chernobyl, after the disaster, the people were evacuated. And then people were sent in to do cleanup and all of these things that were taking place. And they would come in and all that there were were animals setting up nests in children's prams that had been left behind. They would come into houses and inside those houses, the beasts had come in and made their dwelling place. And this is the description that's given in these covenant curses that we'll talk about in a moment in a bit more detail. But this is the pattern that's talked about here, that when you look at this history, God's covenant curses as his people have abandoned him. He repeals and takes away the covenant blessings and he allows the covenant curses to come in. And the purpose of those covenant curses is to lead us to repentance. And we'll talk about that in more detail, but this is an apt description of the corrupt church period from approximately 538 up through the 1500s and onward. At this point, in the story, we come to the fifth seal. Now, the fifth seal is very different. How many horses did we have? Four. But now the rest of these seven seals do not follow the same pattern. Horse one, horse two, horse three, horse four. And now we have three very different symbols. But these three different symbols are very fascinating. Seal number five, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain, remember that word, for the word of God and for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice saying, what did they say? How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. We have a description here of the altar of sacrifice in the Old Testament tabernacle system, and it says that the souls of the martyrs, those who were faithful to God and died for their faith, were underneath the altar crying out, How long, God? How long until you vindicate us? Because we have been put to death against our will. We were put to death unlawfully, unrighteously. Now this is all symbolic language, right? What do these symbols mean? The word for slain is the same word we read before. 
always has to do with persecution of God's people or the persecution of Jesus himself. So this is a description of the martyrs. This is the description of the faithful who have been faithful unto death to Jesus, persecuted for their faith. In Leviticus chapter 4, verse 7, it says that when, when they would offer a sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice, they would sprinkle a bit of the blood of the sacrifice on the horns of the altar. They would take it in and do their thing, right? What do they do with the rest of the blood of the animal? They would pour it out at the base of the altar. It says this three times in the book of Leviticus. When you offer the sacrifice, take the blood and pour it out at the base of the altar. The blood underneath the altar is a symbol of sacrificial death. What's interesting is that in Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, you may remember if you've heard the story before, the first murder in human history was a murder very similar to the death of a martyr, wasn't it? You have the story of Cain and his brother Abel, who both came and brought sacrifices to God. And Abel followed God's instructions, and his sacrifice was received. But Cain followed his own way and made his own plan and his own path to buy his salvation by his own works, his own merits. And God did not accept his sacrifice. Gave him a, a rebuke, an encouragement to change his ways, to come back to him. And what does Cain do? He takes his brother out into the field and premeditatedly murders him. He was slain. And there's this very interesting description in Genesis 4, verse 10. God comes to speak to Cain to confront him about his evil. And he says, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. What's he saying? He's saying, the blood of the innocent victim is calling out for justice. And just like that, this picture is describing the same thing. The symbol of the, the martyred souls crying out. What are they saying? How long, God, until you bring justice? How long until you right the wrongs of planet Earth? How long until you come and vindicate us? How long will we have to stay here in the grave while your name is walked through the mud? When are you going to rise up and do something about this? That's the picture that's given. And what's fascinating is in the midst of that symbol, in the midst of that picture, it says they're given a white robe each. And a white robe is a symbol of purity. It's a symbol of righteousness. It's a symbol of the righteous deeds of the saints in Revelation 19. This is Christ's righteousness given to you, right? The righteousness of God bestowed upon you because you will ultimately inherit the kingdom. Isn't this a beautiful picture? And he says, rest just a little while longer because God is going to judge. And when God judges, those who have received the robe of righteousness by putting their faith and their trust in Jesus will be resurrected and will receive vindication and God will judge things rightly. The sixth seal. You're doing well, by the way. We're almost through. Sixth seal, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place, and the kings of the earth the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. There's an ironic statement. For the great day of his wrath has come. And this question right here, who is able to? to stand. That's a full-on picture, isn't it? So you have this picture. This is a very busy slide, sorry. The sun's turned black, the moon to blood, the stars are falling out of their place. There's these cataclysmic celestial natural signs, right? And then it says every mountain and every island is moved out of its place. And then it has this description of the wicked. And that description is all-encompassing. Rich, poor, educated, uneducated, white, black, male, female, everything. There are no class distinctions here that matter. And they cry out, hide us from the wrath of the lamb 
And then they say this powerful, profound question. Who can stand? Who can stand when God comes to judge? There's some interesting parallels that take place in Matthew 24, where Jesus gives a description of the end of time. And in fact, gives a description from his day down to the end of time. And in Matthew 24, verses 29 and 30, he says this. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will gather his elect from the four winds from all over the earth. You see a bunch of parallels there? There's a lot of parallels. It's almost exactly the same description, isn't it? This is a description of the end of time, is it not? A description of these events that will take place prior to the coming of Christ. And their description, the great day of the wrath of the Lamb, this is the same day that the saints, that those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus will be saying, glory to God, our salvation has come. Because the thing about God's judgment is, it's one event. It's the same event. And to one group of people, it's salvation. And to the other group of people, it's condemnation. To one group of people, it's, it's joy. And to the other, it's terror. It's the same event. It's the same person. It's how they chose to respond to that person that fixes their response, doesn't it? So we have these end time signs. We have the great day of, of the judgment of God. And I love this. This is, so, this is so poignant. Don't miss this. In God's economy, there's only two distinctions of class. Those who receive the gospel and those who reject the gospel. There is no rich, there is no poor. I don't care if you were born in the dirt, the gospel's for you. I don't care if you were born in a palace, the gospel's for you. I don't care if you're educated, the gospel's for you. If you're uneducated, the gospel's for you. It doesn't matter where you were born, what your background, what your stripe that you came from. The gospel is for you. There is no distinction of, of race that is a part of the mix or ethnicity or, or sex or gender or any of these descriptions. Wealth, status, power, none of these descriptions matter. What matters is how you choose to respond to the gospel. There's only two classes at the end, righteous and wicked, saved and lost, and that's it. And what an apt description of the end of the 1700 period Right, we come through the time of the martyrs from the 1500s onward. We come towards the end of the 18th century, getting towards 1755. You've got these cataclysmic events starting to happen that match the descriptions here. You've got all this stuff that happens in 1798 with the end of these institutionalized compromise apostasy in the, in the Christian era. And then you have a, a description here from that point forward until the end of time. At this point in the chapter, you get, we're done with chapter 6. Revelation 6 is over. And there's a, there's a question that it ended with. Who can stand? Who can stand? And unfortunately, you're going to have to wait to hear the answer to that question because that's next week. Because that's, that's Revelation chapter 7. That's the 144,000, right? And there's an interlude that comes into the middle of this linear chronology of prophetic history. That comes in and it tells us the answer to who can stand. And so if you want to know who can stand, come back next week. When we get to the end of that interlude, it comes to the seventh seal in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, and it says this. And this is, we're, we're going to wrap up here shortly. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And that's it. That's the seventh seal. <laughs> Silence. Now here's a question. Why in the world would there be silence in heaven? I thought when we started our review, we learned that day and night continually, the four living creatures worship God by saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And every time that they worship, the 24 elders cast their crowns on the ground and worship God as the creator. And then the lamb shows up and they worship him. It sounds like it's a pretty raucous, noisy place, doesn't it? There's always worship going on all the time, and now all of a sudden we get to the seventh seal, and there's silence, right? The first seal, come. The second seal, come. The third seal, come. The fourth seal, come. The fifth seal, how long? The sixth seal, who can stand? All of this crying out. You get to the seventh seal, and nobody's saying anything. 
How come? And there's two key things that I think we can take from this. In Scripture, there are many places where when God is described as as on his throne in judgment and you've come to his presence for him to execute judgment, it says there is silence before him. And the second logical conclusion is that the only time heaven would be silent is if nobody's there. And is that not a description of Jesus coming to the earth? Right? In Matthew 25, Jesus tells this parable about sheep and goats. And in that parable, he says that when the Son of Man comes to the earth, when he returns, it says all the angels will be with him. What's his point? Everybody left heaven to come with him to come and get you and take you back to heaven. Isn't that beautiful? And so here we have it, the seven seals. It follows a linear chronology of the apostolic period when the gospel is spread, which was followed by a period of a couple of hundred years of persecution, rejection of the gospel, followed by a couple hundred years of compromise within the Christian church broadly, creeping compromise and spiritual scarcity, followed by an apostate church system and corruption broadly across the Christian institution, spiritual death, followed by a Reformation period where there were many people who were martyred, who were crying out for justice, and we have this vindication of God's name, followed by an end-time period of which we live in from the 17, late 1700s onwards, leading up until whenever Jesus comes because he says nobody knows the day or the hour. And when he arrives, there will be silence in heaven and the judgment is complete. There's our timeline history from the first century to the second coming. Does that make sense? Okay. Now here's the important question as we wrap up. Why does any of this matter? What relevance does this have to me living in 2023 right now today? What difference does this make? Point number one. I believe according to Jesus' words in John 14, 29, that the primary reason that God gives prophecy is so that we will believe in him. Jesus said, I've told you these things before they happen so that when they come to pass, you may believe. You may believe that I am, he says in John chapter 13. The primary purpose for knowing this is so that when we look retrospectively back and go, holy, oh, I shouldn't say that. Um, Wow. (laughs) Look, it happens just like God said it was going to happen, that we can be flabbergasted and realize this God who can foretell the future this well must surely be able to save even me. That's the primary purpose of knowing this. But what else can we learn? I want to hone in on these four horsemen because there's something strange. Why do all the symbols seem different except for these four? Here's our spiritual application. In your life and in my life, you will have opportunity to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And when you hear it, if you choose to receive and live out the gospel by God's grace through faith lived out in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. When the gospel is received, that is victory. You can live in a place of victory. You can live in a place where Jesus has forgiven your sins and justified you, declared you righteous, and be in a process of sanctification where he is leading you on a slow upward trajectory to be more and more like Jesus by the grace of God. Looking forward to the completion of salvation which comes when he returns and gives you a new glorified body no longer tempted to sin, no longer cast upon the waters. But whenever the gospel is rejected, we tend to see the sequence of events that looks like this. You become a person who persecutes the gospel. And when you become a person who persecutes the gospel and pushes against it and against those who have received it, you tend to put yourself into a position of spiritual scarcity because you're cutting yourself off from the very words of God. And as you cut yourself off from God's word and you start listening to all the other things and get off that track, you wind up somewhere. And ultimately, that somewhere is spiritual death, isn't it? Because as you cut yourself off from the source of life, there's no other choice but to slowly dwindle away. This is true of church history and a historical application, but it's true for you and for me today. And so the question is, Are you going to live in victory? Will you receive the good news of Jesus? Will you accept that truth and let it be lived out in your life? Or are you going to reject it and walk this pathway towards spiritual death? Because the choice is yours. And you might think to yourself, well, what do we do? What if if I've already rejected that? And by the way, just because you're sitting in a church doesn't mean you're exempt. 
Lots of people will be lost in the church, man. Membership in a church doesn't equate to salvation. Don't, let, don't kid yourself. And not membership of the church doesn't equate to not salvation either. Don't kid yourself there. It's how you respond to what God has done that matters. So here's a question. If I'm in the land of persecution and I've rejected the gospel, is there hope for me? Maybe I'm doing that in my life right now, even calling myself a Christian. Maybe you're in a place of spiritual scarcity where the word of God is so far from your mind and so far from your life that it's not doing you any good because you don't have it. How do you get back to this place? What if you're even over here in spiritual death and you're sitting in this church thinking, man, I'm only here because it's a habit and I don't want people to think too badly about me or I got nothing else to do or my parents made me come or my wife made me come or whatever else. How do I get from spiritual death over here to victory? There's this really, really interesting passage that all of this comes from. Leviticus chapter 21, you know, one of those books that nobody wants to read. And there's this amazing, super fascinating thing I learned this week. God gives these covenant blessings. He makes a covenant, which is a promise, an agreement. And then he says this. He says, I will bless you if you follow me, if you stay within my covenant. Right? He says, I'll bless you. I'll bless the crops. I'll bless this. I'll bless that. I'll bless these things. Right? God gives his blessings to keep us connected, to encourage us on the journey, to bless us. And by the way, it's not all just arbitrary. When you follow God's design, you will automatically be blessed because that's how you flourish as a human being is to follow your design. But then God says this. He says, well, if you reject me, if you turn away from my covenant, he says this. Check this out. Notice and remember, we talked something about sword, famine, pestilence, wild beasts. Check this out. He says, then if you will walk contrary to me and you're not willing to obey me, I'll bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which will rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. We've got two of those four already, don't we? And if by these things you're not reformed by me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I'll punish you yet seven times for your sins. I'll bring a sword against you. There's three. They will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you're gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you. And you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I've cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven. They'll bring back your bread by weight, and you'll eat, and you won't be satisfied. You see all four of those things we talked about that were mentioned? Sword, famine, pestilence, wild beasts. This is all part of the covenant curses. But why would God say such a a challenging thing? You read through, and it gives this description. The whole point is this. He says, but if they confess their iniquity... And the iniquity of their fathers and their unfaithfulness to me. If their uncircumcised hearts are humbled and they accept their guilt, I'll remember my covenant that I made with them, with their fathers. I'll remember their land. He says, for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations that I might be their God. The purpose of the covenant blessings is the same as the purpose of the covenant curses. They're both there to achieve one end, to bring you back into relationship with Jesus. He says, oh, you're my people, and you're walking away, you're getting off track. Okay, well, I'm I'm just going to remove a little bit of my protection. You can experience the natural consequences of your actions. I'll just let you have what you're doing. That way, when you experience it, you'll realize, man, it's really bad over here. Why am I over here? Why don't I come back to God and receive all of those blessings that come from him? Oh, we keep walking the wrong way. He says, come back, come back, come back, receive the blessings. The curses are just as important and just as gracious as the blessings because God's desire is that if you are spiritually dead, turn to him and he'll bring you back to life. If you are spiritually in the place of persecution, he'll save you from that and give you a heart of peace. If you're in a place of spiritual scarcity, he'll bring you into a place of spiritual abundance. But you have to choose to receive that. Takeaways. What can we take away from this? Three things. I'd like to invite the the musicians up. Number one, who was the one who opened the seals? Jesus. 
Jesus is with you in the midst of whatever you are going through in your life, whatever circumstances you have, whichever one of those four horses describes your experience today, Jesus is with you in the midst of it. And he will ultimately set things aright in the final judgment. You may not have full vindication today, but there is a God in heaven who is going to bring justice, and we can be on the right side of that by surrendering and receiving the good gifts that he has to give. He will vindicate your case. You don't have to worry about vengeance. You can leave it to him. Number two, both God's covenant blessings and curses are intended to bring you into a saving relationship with Christ Jesus. God's desire is for everyone to come to repentance and be saved. So whether you're experiencing those covenant blessings or those covenant curses in your life, turn to Jesus. Because God is in the business of saving people like yourself, like myself. And the last thing is this. There are only two classes of people in the end of all things. You won't be saved by your wallet and you won't be saved by your reputation. The only way you'll be saved is by putting your trust in what Jesus has done, is doing, and will do for you. So the question is, are you going to be in the camp of the righteous or the wicked? Are you going to be in the camp of the saved or of the camp of the lost? Because those are the only two glass distinctions in God's economy. How will you choose to respond to God's amazing grace? Will you stand and sing in response? Gracious Father, Lord, we just want to be people who, who follow you wherever you go. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. There are some of us who are experiencing gospel victory in our lives, and there are some of us today who are in places of persecution. There are people in our midst today who are in places of spiritual scarcity, and there are those of us in our midst who are in places of spiritual death. We just want to pray, Lord, that you would raise us to new life in Jesus' name. Bring us back to you, and Lord, we want to 
respond to your blessings and your curses in the same way by leaning into Jesus. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to be useful in this world for your kingdom's glory. And we pray that you would do these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. May God bless you and keep you. Uh, You're all welcome to stay. We have a lunch happening today that will be happening shortly outside. And um, all you want to say, Grace? Lord, please bless the food and the hands that have prepared it. Amen. Amen. Done. And um, also, if you wanted to respond to Bentley and Krister's appeal to come and get involved, feel free to come down to the front. Krister's right here. I'm right here. Um, We'd love to hear from you if you would like to get involved with ministering to some of these beautiful